now we are here for our main service. So I'm very excited to introduce Tom, who is bringing us the service, and it was good. The intersection of earth, mirth, and the blessedness of all creation. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Melissa. I'm gonna start out today's message with a saying you've probably heard dozens of times, especially around Christmas time when our church holds its famous paper bag pageant. Reverend Aaliyah often reminds us, how do you make God laugh? Just make some plans. <laughs> Just make some plans. Well, this is where we are at today. A world where we had so many plans and all of them wound up going into the dumpster. There's actually a phrase in the Bible that sums this up very nicely from the book of Psalms chapter two. God in heaven merely laughs. The creator is amused by all the puny plans of us human beings, including plans for summer church, like who's on tap for preaching this week. When I learned that there was a last minute cancellation for tonight, I was glad to fill in. You see, God was laughing once again. So much for carefully planned worship schedules. And being a rather irreverent reverend myself, I jumped at the opportunity to add a few more laughs to the mix. And speaking of humor, some of you may recall about a month ago, the topic of the night was laughter yoga. I don't think my message will deliver quite as many giggles and chuckles as that one did. But I do have a little helper here who can add some comic relief every once in a while. So I'd like to introduce you to Giggle Puss. Feel free to laugh along as the mood strikes you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you finished? All right. Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I met a man who seemed to be the literal reincarnation of Santa Claus. He was a pastor of a Russian Orthodox church in Syracuse, New York. It was my college years, and Father Alexander took me under his wing, often picking me up and bringing me to church on Sunday mornings. He was jolly, extremely generous with his time, and really embodied the spirit of hospitality. Now, what made him different from any other Russian priest I've ever known was a spirit of joyful service to his community of faith. Joyful service. Compared to the other solemn, stern-faced patriarchs who made church going so dull and boring, Father Alexander was a welcome breath of fresh air. He was always very enthusiastic and so engaging with everyone he met. Now, fast forward 20 years later, after an eventful career in communications, I was now in seminary preparing to go into ministry. And when reading about the early history of the church, I happened upon a quote that someone in ancient Rome had said, describing the early Christians at that time. This was way before they'd started building churches and making religion into a major government-sponsored institution. Believers were still meeting in each other's homes. There were no formal choirs or liturgies, just people worshiping together in a very casual, informal manner in small groups like we have today. It was a very different time. And so this Roman, obviously an outsider, described these early Christians as extremely joyful. He couldn't quite understand why they always seemed so happy, speculating that perhaps it was something in their worship that was very special. Perhaps he was envious, wishing that his life could be just as inspiring or even filled with the same joy and laughter as they had. So um, I thought back to my memory of Father Alexander 20 years earlier, now it all made sense. He was like one of those early Christians, so joyful and good-natured, never judgmental. He was a real pleasure to be around. So this humble priest, this ordinary man of God, wound up being a mentor to me many years before I even dreamed of going to seminary. Then, also during these seminary years, to put the icing on the cake, I discovered that there's a principle called the blessedness of all creation. It was a belief 
that actually dated back to those earliest Christians and which had been nurtured by the Eastern Orthodox Church, but largely ignored in many of the Western Catholic or Protestant churches. The foundation for this belief was the Genesis story in the Bible, when God creates the world. And the question is, what does God say after each day of creation? And God said, saw that it was good. It was good. Not only that, by the sixth day in this version, when man and woman were created, God looked back on the entire creation and announced it was very good. So where do we get this idea that we're all cursed and doomed to plagues and eternal damnation? Well, there were a number of theologians over the years who wound up misinterpreting and distorting the message of the Bible. Instead of being a book of love, we unfortunately wound up with a focus on doom and gloom. Instead of the mitzvahs or blessings common in the Jewish tradition, we worried about fire and brimstone. Instead of showing hospitality to strangers, we began fearing people who were different and even casting them out of our midst. And here in America, when the Puritans came to New England, they began casting out anybody who had a sense of humor. Thankfully, there are other religious traditions that take a different approach. For example, in the Native American culture, among the Apache tribe, there's a creation story of how human beings were given the ability to talk, to run, and to look. But the creator, according to the Apaches, was not satisfied until humans were also given the ability to laugh. Only then did, did the creator say, now you are fit to live. During these troubled times, perhaps we're now being given a subtle reminder of what life is really all about. If there's one thing we need to learn, it's that survival doesn't always demand a stoic, just get over it mentality. On the contrary, having a sense of humor and playfulness may go a lot further in terms of dealing with all the trials and tribulations we face each day. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, it is a happy talent to know how to play. And the psychologist Francis Vaughan goes a step further saying, imaginative play is a key that opens the doors of intuition. And we could all use more of that right now, whether we're fixing a meal for dinner, writing a poem, painting a still life, or finding creative new solutions to the problems of our world. Many years ago, when I worked in advertising, we had to crank out pages and pages of clever slogans and ideas for new, for new ad campaigns. Was it easy? Not always. Sometimes we got stumped by a product that was hard to put into words. Talk about blank page syndrome. We'd stare at our typewriter for hours, trying to come up with the right turn of phrase that would catch people's attention and send them away humming the sponsor's jingle. Well, some of our more enlightened supervisors, seeing a struggle with a blank page, generally told us to take a break from our labors. Essentially, they told us to go out and play. It's time for recess. Go do something different. Visit the library, tour the art museum, see a movie. Anything that will get your mind off of the assignment for just a brief while. And in the most extreme cases, they even said to sleep on it. In other words, put it aside and come back to it the next day when we felt more refreshed. And it worked. That short break and being given the license to play allowed our subconscious to kick in and do what our logical awake mind could not. Even taking a short nap, going to the water cooler, or sharing some jokes with a fellow writer. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Even sharing some jokes with a fellow writer gave us the same opportunity to step away from the plans and venture out in new directions. Now, what does this have to do with religion and inspiration? 
As Frederick and Marianne Brousseau wrote in their book, Spiritual Literacy, play is a pathway to laughter. All the spiritual traditions have full holy fools, clowns, or tricksters who try to tease people into a fuller appreciation of the paradox and mystery of life. There are stories of Zen masters, Hasidic sages, Christian saints, and Muslim mystics who can all help keep us on our toes. And to paraphrase that Genesis story, it is all good. It is very good. During these trying times when we're all struggling to find our way amidst quarantines, lockdowns, protests, government screw-ups, the rising death toll, and forced isolation from friends or family, one thing that I've personally found to be helpful is to turn on the TV and watch something funny. Whether it's late night comedians like Stephen Colbert, new sitcoms like Grace and Frankie, reruns of old shows like The Golden Girls, or even classic movies featuring the Marx Brothers. These all help to dispel the doom and gloom and bring a smile to our face, even if only for a short while. And let's not forget the song parodies of Randy Rainbow either, or the internet show Some Good News with John Krasinski. Both of these programs put current events in a more hopeful light, especially John Krasinski's focus on the good things happening in our world. It's too bad that Krasinski sold off his show and went on to other things, but at least we still have Randy Rainbow. You know, here's a novel thought. Maybe this whole coronavirus thing can serve as a turning point or a catalyst for our entire civilization. All this enforced time off is a way to encourage us to stop and smell the roses. Maybe all work and no play is not healthy for us in the long run. Not only does it take us away from family and friends, it also empties our spiritual gas tanks. So we don't have any energy to spare for things like doing good things for others or making the world a better place. Also, while we're at it, let's try on this for size. What if our education system also needs a break? For many youngsters, School isn't that different from the world of work that enslaves their parents. We've had so many advances in technology since the turn of the century, so it's normal to ask, why hasn't our school system kept up with the rest of our culture? Perhaps we really need to take this time now to re-examine our goals, our dreams and visions, rather than just sending all the kids back to school willy-nilly as if nothing needs to change. As I mentioned earlier, playing can be an act of creativity and imagination. It gives us all, children and adults alike, another way of approaching the stories of our lives and all the problems that we come up against in our daily experience. And perhaps kids, like parents, also need the ability to incorporate more play into their educational process. There is overwhelming evidence that kids do learn well when learning is fun. And personally, I can attest that one of the best teachers I ever had was one who had a great sense of humor and even livened up our classes with occasional stand-up comedy routines. <laughs> yes, our classes were quite fun. Now here's a random thought for the day. What if during this original act of creation billions of years ago, God or a higher power or the spirit of the universe was actually playing around at times and building in laughter and humor into the mix? What else could explain odd creatures like the platypus, the dodo bird, the elephant, or the strangest of all? human beings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As a Unitarian Universalist, I have to confess that there are many different belief systems out there. And whether you believe in the creation story I've shared tonight, or take a different, more scientific approach like evolution, 
and the Big Bang Theory, there's one thing that perhaps we can all agree on. And that's the idea that playing around is a good and holy thing, as Frederick and Mary Ann Rousseau once said. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Playing allows us to express ourselves creatively, to use our intuition and imagination, to savor pleasure and the lightness of being, and to act as co-creators, making our own humble contributions to the perpetually unfinished masterpiece of this big universe, in which we're all interconnected, sometimes by our funny bones. And when it's all over, and we will look back at what we've created, we too can say, it was good. It was very good. Amen. <laughs>